Think and Grow Rich, teaching for the first time the famous Andrew Carnegie formula for money-making, based upon the 13 proven steps to riches. Organized through 25 years of research in collaboration with more than 500 distinguished men of great wealth, who proved by their own achievements that this philosophy is practical, by Napoleon Hill, author of The Law of Success Philosophy, published by the Ralston Society, 1938, Meridian, Connecticut. Copyright 1937 by Napoleon Hill. All rights reserved. Tributes to the author from Great American Leaders. Think and Grow Rich was 25 years in the making. It is Napoleon Hill's newest book based upon his famous law of success philosophy. His work and writings have been praised by great leaders in finance, education, politics, government. Supreme Court of the United States, Washington, D.C. Dear Mr. Hill, I have now had an opportunity to finish reading your Law of Success textbooks, and I wish to express my appreciation of the splendid work you have done in the organization of this philosophy. It would be helpful if every politician in the country would assimilate and apply the 17 principles upon which your lessons are based. It contains some very fine material which every leader in every walk of life should understand. I am happy to have had the privilege of rendering you some slight measure of help in the organization of this splendid course of common-sense philosophy. Sincerely yours, Howard Taft, former President and former Chief Justice of the United States, King of the Five and Ten Cent Stores. By applying many of the seventeen fundamentals of the law of success philosophy, we have built a great chain of successful stores. I presume it would be no exaggeration of fact if I said that the Woolworth Building might properly be called a monument to the soundness of these principles. F. W. Woolworth A Great Steamship Magnate I feel greatly indebted for the privilege of reading your law of success. If I had had this philosophy fifty years ago, I suppose I could have accomplished all that I have done in less than half the time. I sincerely hope the world will discover and reward you. Robert Dollar Famous American Labor Leader Mastery of the Law of Success Philosophy is the equivalent of an insurance policy against failure. Samuel Gompers A former President of the United States May I not congratulate you on your persistence. Any man who devotes that much time must of necessity make discoveries of great value to others. I am deeply impressed by your interpretation of the mastermind principles which you have so clearly described. Woodrow Wilson A Merchant Prince I know that your seventeen fundamentals of success are sound because I have been applying them in my business for more than thirty years. John Wanamaker World's Largest Maker of Cameras I know that you are doing a world of good with your law of success. I would not care to set a monetary value on this training because it brings to the student qualities which cannot be measured by money alone. George Eastman, a nationally known business chief. Whatever success I may have attained, I owe entirely to the application of your 17 fundamental principles of the law of success. I believe I have the honor of being your first student. W. M. Wrigley, Jr. Author's Preface In every chapter of this book, mention has been made of the money-making secret which has made fortunes for more than 500 exceedingly wealthy men whom I have carefully analyzed over a long period of years. The secret was brought to my attention by Andrew Carnegie more than a quarter of a century ago. The canny, lovable old Scotsman carelessly tossed it into my mind when I was but a boy. Then he sat back in his chair with a merry twinkle in his eyes and watched carefully to see if I had brains enough to understand the full significance of what he had said to me. When he saw that I had grasped the idea, he asked if I would be willing to spend twenty years or more preparing myself to take it to the world, to men and women who, without the secret, might go through life as failures. I said I would, and with Mr. Carnegie's cooperation, I have kept my promise. This book contains the secret after having been put to a practical test by thousands of people in almost every walk of life. It was Mr. Carnegie's idea that the magic formula, which gave him a stupendous fortune, 
ought to be placed within reach of people who do not have time to investigate how men make money, and it was his hope that I might test and demonstrate the soundness of the formula through the experience of men and women in every calling. He believed the formula should be taught in all public schools and colleges, and expressed the opinion that if it were properly taught it would so revolutionize the entire educational system that the time spent in school could be reduced to less than half. His experience with Mr. Charles M. Schwab and other young men of Mr. Schwab's type convinced Mr. Carnegie that much of that which is taught in the schools is of no value whatsoever in connection with the business of earning a living or accumulating riches. He had arrived at this decision because he had taken into his business one young man after another, many of them with but little schooling, and by coaching them in the use of this formula, developed in them rare leadership. Moreover, his coaching made fortunes for every one of them who followed his instructions. In the chapter on faith, you will read the astounding story of the organization of the giant United States Steel Corporation, as it was conceived and carried out by one of the young men through whom Mr. Carnegie proved that his formula will work for all who are ready for it. This single application of the secret, by that young man, Charles M. Schwab, made him a huge fortune in both money and opportunity. Roughly speaking, this particular application of the formula was worth six hundred million dollars. These facts, and they are facts well known to almost everyone who knew Mr. Carnegie, give you a fair idea of what the reading of this book may bring to you, provided you know what it is that you want. Even before it has undergone twenty years of practical testing, the secret was passed on to more than one hundred thousand men and women who have used it for their personal benefit, as Mr. Carnegie planned that they should. Some have made fortunes with it, Others have used it successfully in creating harmony in their homes. A clergyman used it so effectively that it brought him an income of upwards of 75000 a year. Author Nash, a Cincinnati tailor, used his near-bankrupt business as a guinea pig on which to test the formula. The business came to life and made a fortune for its owners. It is still thriving, although Mr. Nash has gone. The experiment was so unique that newspapers and magazines gave it more than a million dollars' worth of laudatory publicity. The secret was passed on to Stuart Austin Weir of Dallas, Texas. He was ready for it, so ready that he gave up his profession and studied law. Did he succeed? That story is told, too. I gave the secret to Jennings Randolph the day he graduated from college, and he has used it so successfully that he is now serving his third term as a member of Congress with an excellent opportunity to keep on using it until it carries him to the White House. While serving as advertising manager of the LaSalle Extension University, when it was little more than a name, I had the privilege of seeing J. G. Chaplin, president of the university, use the formula so effectively that he has since made the LaSalle one of the great extension schools of the country. The secret to which I refer has been mentioned no fewer than a hundred times throughout this book. It has not been directly named, for it seems to work more successfully when it is merely uncovered and left in sight, where those who are ready and searching for it may pick it up. That is why Mr. Carnegie tossed it to me so quietly without giving me its specific name. If you are ready to put it to use... You will recognize this secret at least once in every chapter. I wish I might feel privileged to tell you how you will know if you are ready, but that would deprive you of much of the benefit you will receive when you make the discovery in your own way. While this book was being written, my own son, who was then finishing the last year of his college work, picked up the manuscript of chapter 2, read it, and discovered the secret for himself. He used the information so effectively that he went directly into a responsible position at a beginning salary greater than the average man ever earns. His story has been briefly described in Chapter 2. When you read it, perhaps you will dismiss any feeling you may have had at the beginning of the book that it promised too much. And two, if you have ever been discouraged, if you have had difficulties to surmount which took the very soul out of you, 
if you have tried and failed, if you were ever handicapped by illness or physical affliction, this story of my son's discovery and use of the Carnegie formula may prove to be the oasis in the desert of lost hope for which you have been searching. This secret was extensively used by President Woodrow Wilson during the World War. It was passed on to every soldier who fought in the war, carefully wrapped in the training received before going to the front. President Wilson told me it was a strong factor in raising the funds needed for the war. More than twenty years ago, Honorable Manuel L. Quizon, then Resident Commissioner of the Philippine Islands, was inspired by the secret to gain freedom for his people. He has gained freedom for the Philippines and is the first president of the free state. A peculiar thing about this secret is that those who once acquire it and use it find themselves literally swept on to success with but little effort and they never again submit to failure. If you doubt this, study the names of those who have used it wherever they have been mentioned. Check their records for yourself and be convinced. There is no such thing as something for nothing. The secret to which I refer cannot be had without a price, although the price is far less than its value. It cannot be had at any price by those who are not intentionally searching for it. It cannot be given away. It cannot be purchased for money. For the reason that it comes in two parts, one part is already in possession of those who are ready for it. The secret serves equally well all who are ready for it. Education has nothing to do with it. Long before I was born, the secret had found its way into the possession of Thomas A. Edison, and he used it so intelligently that he became the world's leading inventor, although he had but three months of schooling. The secret was passed on to a business associate of Mr. Edison. He used it so effectively that although he was then making only $12,000 a year, he accumulated a great fortune and retired from active business while still a young man. You will find his story at the beginning of the first chapter. It should convince you that riches are not beyond your reach, that you can still be what you wish to be, that money, fame, recognition, and happiness can be had by all who are ready and determined to have these blessings. How do I know these things? You should have the answer before you finish this book. You may find it in the very first chapter or on the last page. While I was performing the twenty-year task of research, which I had undertaken at Mr. Carnegie's request, I analyzed hundreds of well-known men, many of whom admitted that they had accumulated their vast fortunes through the aid of the Carnegie secret. Among these men were Henry Ford, William Wrigley, Jr., John Wanamaker, James J. Hill, George S. Parker, E. M. Statler, Henry L. Doherty, Cyrus K. Curtis, George Eastman, Theodore Roosevelt, John W. Davis, Albert Hubbard, Wilbur Wright, William Jennings Bryan, Dr. Demitted Star Jordan, J. Ogden Armour, Charles M. Swab, Harris F. Williams, Dr. Frank Gonzalez, Daniel Willard, King Gillette, Ralph A. Weeks, Judge Daniel T. Wright, John D. Rockefeller, Thomas A. Edison, Frank A. Vanderlip, F. W. Woolworth, Colonel Robert A. Dollar, Edward A. Feline, Edwin C. Barnes, Arthur Brisbane, Woodrow Wilson, William Howard Taft, Luther Burbank, Edward W. Bach, Frank A. Munsey, Albert H. Gary, Dr. Alexander Graham Bell, John H. Patterson, Julius Rosenweld, Stuart Austin Weir, Dr. Frank Crane, George M. Alexander, J. G. Chaplin, Honorable Jennings Randolph, Arthur Nash, Clarence Darrow. These names represent but a small fraction of the hundreds of well-known Americans whose achievements, financially and otherwise, prove that those who understand and apply the Carnegie secret reach high stations in life. I have never known anyone who was inspired to use the secret who did not achieve noteworthy success in his chosen calling. I have never known any person to distinguish himself or to accumulate riches of any consequence without possession of the secret. From these two facts, I draw the conclusion that the secret is more important as a part of the knowledge essential for self-determination than any which one receives through what is popularly known as education. What is education, anyway? This has been answered in full detail. 
As far as schooling is concerned, many of these men had very little. John Wanamaker once told me that what little schooling he had he acquired in very much the same manner as a modern locomotive takes on water by scooping it up as it runs. Henry Ford never reached high school, let alone college. I am not attempting to minimize the value of schooling, but I am trying to express my earnest belief that those who master and apply the secret will reach high stations, accumulate riches, and bargain with life on their own terms, even if their schooling has been meager. Somewhere, as you read, the secret to which I refer will jump from the page and stand boldly before you, if you are ready for it. When it appears, you will recognize it. Whether you receive the sign in the first or the last chapter, stop for a moment when it presents itself, and turn down a glass, for that occasion will mark the most important turning point of your life. We pass now to chapter 1, and to the story of my very dear friend who has generously acknowledged having seen the mystic sign, and whose business achievements are evidence enough that he turned down a glass. As you read his story and the others, remember that they deal with the important problems of life such as all men experience. The problems arising from one's endeavor to earn a living, to find hope, courage, contentment, and peace of mind, to accumulate riches and to enjoy freedom of body and spirit. Remember, too, as you go through the book, that it deals with facts and not with fiction, its purpose being to convey a great universal truth through which all who are ready may learn, not only what to do, but also how to do it, and receive as well the needed stimulus to make a start. As a final word of preparation, before you begin the first chapter, may I offer one brief suggestion which may provide a clue by which the Carnegie secret may be recognized. It is this. All achievement, all earned riches, have their beginning in an idea. If you are ready for the secret, you already possess one half of it. Therefore, you will readily recognize the other half the moment it reaches your mind. The Author Chapter 1. Introduction. The Man Who Thought His Way Into Partnership with Thomas A. Edison. Truly, thoughts are things, and powerful things at that. When they are mixed with definiteness of purpose, persistence, and a burning desire for their translation into riches or other material objects. A little more than thirty years ago, Edwin C. Barnes discovered how true it is that men really do think and grow rich. His discovery did not come about at one sitting. It came little by little, beginning with a burning desire to become a business associate of the great Edison. One of the chief characteristics of Barnes' desire was that it was definite. He wanted to work with Edison, not for him. Observe carefully the description of how he went about translating his desire into reality, and you will have a better understanding of the thirteen principles which lead to riches. When this desire, or impulse of thought, first flashed into his mind, he was in no position to act upon it. Two difficulties stood in his way. He did not know Mr. Edison, and he did not have enough money to pay his railroad fare to Orange, New Jersey. These difficulties were sufficient to have discouraged the majority of men from making any attempt to carry out the desire. But this was no ordinary desire. He was so determined to find a way to carry out his desire that he finally decided to travel by blind baggage rather than be defeated. To the uninitiated, this means that he went to East Orange on a freight train. He presented himself at Mr. Edison's laboratory and announced he had come to go into business with the inventor. In speaking of the first meeting between Barnes and Edison years later, Mr. Edison said, he stood there before me, looking like an ordinary tramp, but there was something in the expression of his face which conveyed the impression that he was determined to get what he had come after. I had learned from years of experience with men that when a man really desires a thing so deeply that he is willing to stake his entire future on a single turn of the wheel in order to get it, he is sure to win. I gave him the opportunity he asked for, because I saw he had made up his mind to stand by until he succeeded. Subsequent events proved that no mistake was made. Just what young Barnes said to Mr. Edison on that occasion was far less important than that which he thought. 
Edison himself said so. It could not have been the young man's appearance which got him his start in the Edison office, for that was definitely against him. It was what he thought that counted. If the significance of this statement could be conveyed to every person who reads it, there would be no need for the remainder of this book. Barnes did not get his partnership with Edison on his first interview. He did get a chance to work in the Edison offices at a very nominal wage, doing work that was unimportant to Edison, but most important to Barnes, because it gave him an opportunity to display his merchandise where his intended partner could see it. Months went by. Apparently nothing happened to bring the converted goal which Barnes had set up in his mind as his definite major purpose. But something important was happening in Barnes's mind. He was constantly intensifying his desire to become the business associate of Edison. Psychologists have correctly said that when one is truly ready for a thing, it puts in its appearance. Barnes was ready for a business association with Edison. Moreover, he was determined to remain ready until he got that which he was seeking. He did not say to himself, Ah, well, what's the use? I guess I'll change my mind and try for a salesman's job. But he did say, I came here to go into business with Edison, and I'll accomplish this end if it takes the remainder of my life. He meant it. What a different story men would have to tell if only they would adopt a definite purpose and stand by that purpose until it had time to become an all-consuming obsession. Maybe young Barnes did not know it at the time, but his bulldog determination, his persistence in standing back of a single desire, was destined to mow down all opposition and bring him the opportunity he was seeking. When the opportunity came, it appeared in a different form, and from a different direction than Barnes had expected. That is one of the tricks of opportunity. It has a sly habit of slipping in by the back door, and often it comes disguised in the form of misfortune or temporary defeat. Perhaps this is why so many fail to recognize opportunity. Mr. Edison had just perfected a new office device known at that time as the Edison Dictating Machine, now the Edaphone. His salesmen were not enthusiastic over the machine. They did not believe it could be sold without great effort. Barnes saw his opportunity. It had crawled in quietly, hidden in a queer-looking machine which interested no one but Barnes and the inventor. Barnes knew he could sell the Edison Dictating Machine. He suggested this to Edison and promptly got his chance. He did sell the machine. In fact, he sold it so successfully that Edison gave him a contract to distribute and market it all over the nation. Out of that business association grew the slogan, Made by Edison and Installed by Barnes. The business alliance has been in operation for more than 30 years. Out of it, Barnes has made himself rich in money, but he has done something infinitely greater. He has proved that one really may think and grow rich. How much actual cash that original desire of Barnes has been worth to him, I have no way of knowing. Perhaps it has brought him two or three million dollars, but the amount, whatever it is, becomes insignificant when compared with the greater asset he acquired in the form of definite knowledge that an intangible impulse of thought can be transmuted into its physical counterpart by the application of known principles. Barnes literally thought himself into a partnership with the great Edison. He thought himself into a fortune. He had nothing to start with except the capacity to know what he wanted and the determination to stand by that desire until he realized it. He had no money to begin with. He had but little education. He had no influence, but he did have initiative, faith, and the will to win. With these intangible forces, he made himself number one man, with the greatest inventor who ever ever lived. Now let us look at a different situation and study a man who had plenty of tangible evidence of riches, but lost it, because he stopped three feet short of the goal he was seeking. Three Feet from Gold One of the most common causes of failure is the habit of quitting when one is overtaken by temporary defeat. Every person is guilty of this mistake at one time or another. An uncle of R. U. Darby was caught by the gold fever in the gold rush days and went west to dig and grow rich. 
He had never heard that more gold has been mined from the brains of men than has ever been taken from the earth. He staked a claim and went to work with pick and shovel. The going was hard, but his lust for gold was definite. After weeks of labor, he was rewarded by the discovery of the shining ore. He needed machinery to bring the ore to the surface. Quietly, he covered up the mine, retraced his footsteps to his home in Williamsburg, Maryland, told his relatives and a few neighbors of the strike. They got together money for the needed machinery, had it shipped. The uncle and Darby went back to work the mine. The first car of ore was mined and shipped to a smelter. The returns proved they had one of the richest mines in Colorado. A few more cars of that ore would clear the debts. Then would come the big killing and profits. Down went the drills, up went the hopes of Darby and Uncle. Then something happened. The vein of gold ore disappeared. They had come to the end of the rainbow, and the pot of gold was no longer there. They drilled on, desperately trying to pick up the vein again, all to no avail. Finally, they decided to quit. They sold the machinery to a junk man for a few hundred dollars and took the train back home. Some junk men are dumb, but not this one. He called in a mining engineer to look at the mine and do a little calculating. The engineer advised that the project had failed because the owners were not familiar with fault lines. His calculation showed that the vein would be found just three feet from where the Darbys had stopped drilling. That is exactly where it was found. The junk man took millions of dollars in ore from the mine because he knew enough to seek expert counsel before giving up. Most of the money which went into the machinery was procured through the efforts of R.U. Darby, who was then a very young man. The money came from his relatives and neighbors because of their faith in him. He paid back every dollar of it, although he was years in doing so. Long afterward, Mr. Darby recouped his loss many times over when he made the discovery that desire can be transmuted into gold. The discovery came after he went into the business of selling life insurance. Remembering that he had lost a huge fortune because he stopped three feet from gold, Darby profited by the experience in his chosen work by the simple method of saying to himself, I stopped three feet from gold, but I will never stop because men say no when I ask them to buy insurance. Darby is one of a small group of fewer than 50 men who sell more than a million dollars in life insurance annually. He owes his stickability to the lesson he learned from his quitability in the gold mining business. Before success comes in any man's life, he is sure to meet with much temporary defeat, and perhaps some failure. When defeat overtakes a man, the easiest and most logical thing to do is to quit. That is exactly what the majority of men do. More than 500 of the most successful men this country has ever known told the author their greatest success came just one step beyond the point at which defeat had overtaken them. Failure is a trickster with a keen sense of irony and cunning. It takes great delight in tripping one when success is almost within reach. A 50 Cent Lesson in Persistence Shortly after Mr. Darby received his degree from the University of Hard Knocks and had decided to profit by his experience in the gold mining business, he had the good fortune to be present on an occasion that proved to him that no does not necessarily mean no. One afternoon he was helping his uncle grind wheat in an old-fashioned mill. The uncle operated a large farm on which a number of colored sharecrop farmers lived. Quietly the door was opened and a small colored child, the doctor of a tenant, walked in and took her place near the door. The uncle looked up, saw the child, and barked at her roughly. "'What do you want?' meekly the child replied. "'My mammy say send her fifty cents.' "'I'll not do it,' the uncle retorted. "'Now run on home.' "'Yes, sir,' the child replied, but she did not move. The uncle went ahead with his work so busily engaged that he did not pay enough attention to the child to observe that she did not leave. When he looked up and saw her still standing there, he yelled at her, "'I told you to go on home.' Now go or I'll take a switch to you. The little girl said, Yassa, but she did not budge an inch. 
The uncle dropped a sack of grain he was about to pour into the mill hopper, picked up a barrel stave, and started toward the child with an expression on his face that indicated trouble. Darby held his breath. He was certain he was about to witness a murder. He knew his uncle had a fierce temper. He knew that the colored children were not supposed to defy white people in that part of the country. When the uncle reached the spot where the child was standing, she quickly stepped forward, one step, looked up into his eyes, and screamed at the top of her shrill voice, "'My mammy's got to have that fifty cents!' The uncle stopped, looked at her for a minute, and then slowly laid the barrel stave on the floor, put his hand in his pocket, took out a half a dollar, and gave it to her. The child took the money and slowly backed toward the door, never taking her eyes off the man whom she had just conquered— after she had gone, the uncle sat down on a box and looked out the window into space for more than ten minutes. He was pondering with awe over the whipping he had just taken. Mr. Darby, too, was doing some thinking. That was the first time in all his experience that he had seen a colored child deliberately master an adult white person. How did she do it? What happened to his uncle that caused him to lose his fierceness and become as docile as a lamb? What strange power did this child use that made her master over her superior? These and other similar questions flashed into Darby's mind, but he did not find the answer until years later when he told me the story. Strangely, the story of this unusual experience was told to the author in the old mill on the very spot where the uncle took his whipping. Strangely, too, I had devoted nearly a quarter of a century to the study of the power which enabled an ignorant, illiterate colored child to conquer an intelligent man. As we stood there in that musty old mill, Mr. Darby repeated the story of the unusual conquest, and finished by asking, What can you make of it? What strange power did that child use that so completely whipped my uncle? The answer to his question will be found in the principles described in this book. The answer is full and complete. It contains details and instructions sufficient to enable anyone to understand and apply the same force which the little child accidentally stumbled upon. Keep your mind alert, and you will observe exactly what strange power came to the rescue of the child. You will catch a glimpse of this power in the next chapter. Somewhere in the book you will find an idea that will quicken your receptive powers and place at your command, for your own benefit, this same irresistible power. The awareness of this power may come to you in the first chapter, or it may flash into your mind in some subsequent chapter. It may come in the form of a single idea, or it may come in the nature of a plan or a purpose. Again, it may cause you to go back into your past experiences of failure or defeat, and bring to the surface some lesson by which you can regain all that you lost through defeat. After I had described to Mr. Darby the power unwittingly used by the little colored child, he quickly retraced his thirty years of experience as a life insurance salesman and frankly acknowledged that his success in that field was due in no small degree to the lesson he had learned from the child. Mr. Darby pointed out, Every time a prospect tried to bow me out without buying, I saw that child standing there in the old mill, her big eyes glaring in defiance, and I said to myself, I've got to make this sale. The better portion of all sales I have made were made after people had said no. He recalled, too, his mistake in having stopped only three feet from gold. But, he said, that experience was a blessing in disguise. It taught me to keep on keeping on, no matter how hard the going may be, a lesson I needed to learn before I could succeed in anything. This story of Mr. Darby and his uncle... The colored child in the gold mine doubtless will be read by hundreds of men who make their living by selling life insurance, and to all of these the author wishes to offer the suggestion that Darby owes to these two experiences in his ability to sell more than a million dollars of life insurance every year. Life is strange and often imponderable. Both the successes and the failures have their roots in simple experiences. Mr. Darby's experiences were commonplace and simple enough. Yet they held the answer to his destiny in life. Therefore, they were as important to him as life itself. He profited by these two dramatic experiences because he analyzed them and found the lesson they taught. But what of the man who has neither the time nor the inclination to study failure in search of knowledge that may lead to success? 
Where and how is he to learn the art of converting defeat into stepping stones to opportunity? In the answer to these questions, this book was written. The answer called for a description of thirteen principles, but remember, as you read, the answer you may be seeking to the questions which have caused you to ponder over the strangeness of life may be found in your own mind, through some idea, plan, or purpose which may spring into your mind as you read. One sound idea is all that one needs to achieve success. The principles described in this book contain the best and the most practical of all that is known concerning the ways and means of creating useful ideas. Before we go any further in our approach to the description of these principles, we believe you are entitled to receive this important suggestion. When riches begin to come, they come so quickly in such great abundance that one wonders where they have been hiding during all those lean years. This is an astounding statement, and all the more so when we take into consideration the popular belief that riches come only to those who work hard and long. When you begin to think and grow rich, you will observe that riches begin with a state of mind, with definiteness of purpose, with little or no hard work. You and every other person ought to be interested in knowing how to acquire that state of mind which will attract riches. I spent 25 years in research, analyzing more than 25,000 people, because I too wanted to know how wealthy men become that way. Without that research, this book could not have been written. Here, take notice of a very significant truth, viz. The business depression started in 1929 and continued on to an all-time record of destruction until some time after President Roosevelt entered office. Then the depression began to fade into nothingness. Just as an electrician in a theater raises the light so gradually that darkness is transmuted into light before you realize it, so did the spell of fear in the minds of the people gradually fade away and become faith. Observe very closely as soon as you master the principles of this philosophy and begin to follow the instructions for applying those principles. Your financial status will begin to improve, and everything you touch will begin to transmute itself into an asset for your own benefit. Impossible? Not at all! One of the main weaknesses of mankind is the average man's familiarity with the word impossible. He knows all the rules which will not work. He knows all the things which cannot be done. This book was written for those who seek the rules which have made others successful and are willing to stake everything on those rules. A great many years ago I purchased a fine dictionary. The first thing I did with it was to turn to the word impossible and neatly clip it out of the book. That would not be an unwise thing for you to do. Success comes to those who become success conscious. Failure comes to those who indifferently allow themselves to become failure conscious. The object of this book is to help all who seek it to learn the art of changing their minds from failure consciousness to success consciousness. Another weakness found in altogether too many people is the habit of measuring everything and everyone by their own impressions and beliefs. Some who will read this will believe that no one can think and grow rich. They cannot think in terms of riches because their thought habits have been steeped in poverty, want, misery, failure, and defeat. These unfortunate people remind me of the prominent Chinese who came to America to be educated in American ways. He attended the University of Chicago, one day, President Harper met this young Oriental on the campus, stopped to chat with him for a few minutes, and asked what had impressed him as being the most noticeable characteristic of the American people. Why, the Chinaman exclaimed, the queer slant of your eyes! Your eyes are off slant! What do we say about the Chinese? We refuse to believe that which we do not understand. We foolishly believe that our own limitations are the proper measurement of limitations. Sure, the other fellow's eyes are off slant, because they are not the same as our own. Millions of people look at the achievements of Henry Ford after he has arrived and envy him, because of his good fortune, or luck, or genius, or whatever it is that they credit for Ford's fortune. Perhaps one person in every hundred thousand knows the secret of Ford's success, and those who do know are too modest or too reluctant to speak of it, because of its simplicity. 
A single transaction will illustrate the secret perfectly. A few years back, Ford decided to produce his now famous V8 motor. He chose to build an engine with the entire eight cylinders cast in one block and instructed his engineers to produce a design for the engine. The design was placed on paper, but the engineers agreed to a man that it was simply impossible to cast an eight-cylinder gas engine block in one piece. Ford said, Produce it anyway. But, they replied, it's impossible. Go ahead, Ford commanded, and stay on the job until you succeed, no matter how much time is required. The engineers went ahead. There was nothing else for them to do if they were to remain on the Ford staff. Six months went by, nothing happened. Another six months passed, and still nothing happened. The engineers tried every conceivable plan to carry out the orders, but the thing seemed out of the question. Impossible! At the end of the year, Ford checked with his engineers, and again they informed him that they had found no way to carry out his orders. Go right ahead, said Ford. I want it, and I'll have it. They went ahead, and then, as if by a stroke of magic, the secret was discovered. The Ford determination had won once more. This story may not be described with minute accuracy, but the sum and substance of it is correct. Deduce from it, you who wish to think and grow rich, the secret of the Ford millions, if you can. You will not have to look very far. Henry Ford is a success because he understands and applies the principles of success. One of these is desire, knowing what one wants. Remember this Ford story as you read and pick out the lines in which the secret of his stupendous achievement has been described. If you can do this, if you can lay your finger on the particular group of principles which made Henry Ford rich, you can equal his achievements in almost any calling for which you are suited. You are the master of your fate, the captain of your soul, because... When Hindley wrote the prophetic lines, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul, he should have informed us that we are the masters of our fate, the captains of our souls, because we have the power to control our thoughts. He should have told us that the ether in which this little earth floats, in which we move and have our being, is a form of energy moving at an inconceivably high rate of vibration, and that the ether is filled with a form of universal power which adapts itself to the nature of the thoughts we hold in our minds and influences us in natural ways to transmute our thoughts into their physical equivalent. If the poet had told us of this great truth, we would know why it is that we are the masters of our fate, the captains of our souls. He should have told us with great emphasis that this power makes no attempt to discriminate between the destructive thoughts and the constructive thoughts, that it will urge us to translate into physical reality thoughts of poverty just as quickly as it will influence us to act upon thoughts of riches. He should have told us, too, that our brains become magnetized with the dominating thoughts which we hold in our minds. And by means with which no man is familiar, these magnets attract to us the forces, the people, the circumstances of life, which harmonize with the nature of our dominating thoughts. He should have told us that before we can accumulate riches in great abundance, we must magnetize our minds with intense desire for riches, that we must become money conscious until the desire for money drives us to create definite plans for acquiring it. But being a poet and not a philosopher, Henley contented himself by stating a great truth in poetic form, leaving those who followed him to interpret the philosophical meaning of his lines. Little by little the truth has unfolded itself until it now appears certain that the principles described in this book hold the secret of mastery over our economic fate. We are now ready to examine the first of these principles, maintain a spirit of open-mindedness, and remember as you read they are the invention of no one man. The principles were gathered from the life experiences of more than five hundred men who actually accumulated riches in huge amounts, Men who began in poverty, with but little education, without influence. The principles worked for these men. You can put them to work for your own enduring benefit. You will find it easy, not hard, to do. Before you read the next chapter, 
I want you to know that it conveys factual information which might easily change your entire financial destiny, as it has so definitely brought the changes of stupendous proportions to two people described. I want you to know also that the relationship between these two men and myself is such that I could have taken no liberties with the facts, even if I had wished to do so. One of them has been my closest personal friend for almost twenty-five years, and the other is my own son. The unusual success of these two men, success which they generously accredit to the principle described in the next chapter, more than justifies this personal reference as a means of emphasizing the far-flung power of this principle. Almost fifteen years ago, I delivered the commencement address at Salem College, Salem, West Virginia. I emphasized the principle described in the next chapter with so much intensity that one of the members of the graduating class definitely appropriated it and made it a part of his own philosophy. The young man is now a member of Congress and an important factor in the present administration. Just before this book went to the publisher, he wrote me a letter in which he so clearly stated his opinion of the principle outlined in the next chapter that I have chosen to publish his letter as an introduction to that chapter. It gives you an idea of the rewards to come. My dear Napoleon, my service as a member of Congress, having given me an insight into the problems of men and women, I am writing to offer a suggestion which may become helpful to thousands of worthy people. With apologies, I must state that the suggestion, if acted upon, will mean several years of labor and responsibility for you, but I am enheartened to make the suggestion because I know your great love for rendering useful service. In 1922, you delivered the commencement address at Salem College when I was a member of the graduating class. In that address, you planted in my mind an idea which has been responsible for the opportunity I now have to serve the people of my state, and will be responsible in a very large measure for whatever success I may have in the future. The suggestion I have in mind is that you put into a book the sum and substance of the address you delivered at Salem College and in that way give the people of America an opportunity to profit by your many years of experience and association with the men who, by their greatness, have made America the richest nation on earth. I recall, as though it were yesterday, the marvelous description you gave of the method by which Henry Ford, with but little schooling, without a dollar, with no influential friends, rose to great heights. I made up my mind then, even before you had finished your speech, that I would make a place for myself, no matter how many difficulties I had to surmount. Thousands of young people will finish their schooling this year, and within the next few years. Every one of them will be seeking just such a method of practical encouragement as the one I received from you. They will want to know where to turn, what to do, to get started in life. You can tell them because you have helped to solve the problems of so many, many people. If there is any possible way that you can afford to render so great a service, may I offer the suggestion that you include with every book one of your personal analysis charts, in order that the purchaser of the book may have the benefit of a complete self-inventory, indicating, as you indicated to me years ago, exactly what is standing in the way of success. Such a service as this, providing the readers of your book with a complete unbiased picture of their faults and their virtues, would mean to them the difference between success and failure. The service would be priceless. Millions of people are now facing the problem of staging a comeback because of the Depression, and I speak from personal experience when I say I know these earnest people would welcome the opportunity to tell you their problems and to receive your suggestions for the solution. You know the problems of those who face the necessity of beginning all over again. There are thousands of people in America today who would like to know how they can convert ideas into money, people who must start at scratch without finances and recoup their losses. If anyone can help them, you can. If you publish the book, I would like to own the first copy that comes from the press, personally autographed by you. With best wishes, believe me, Cordially yours, Jennings Randolph. This ends Chapter 1 of Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill and read by Sean Penning, author of the new novel The Cicadas.